Good afternoon. To answer your question, Jacques, there is no official English name of our university. Uh, we are the only university in Switzerland that does not have an English name. We are the Università della Svizzera Italiana, informally University of Lugano. Um, so yes, I am going to do a little bit different than those of you who've been here in the past. We typically have a chair and three presentations and the chair moderates. And I said, no, I want to do it all. So I'm going to both chair and speak. Um, I am very passionate about the work I do. And you'll probably understand that after you hear me speak a little bit. I'm passionate about it. And I, I think what I see in this room and what I've seen in the last years of attending this conference is you all are as well. So I love this meeting. And I love that Clarissa and Doug have joined us here for the first time so they can also experience it and experience that this is not just a typical conference. This is a meeting where we get to know each other and we get to work with each other and we collaborate after. And that is absolutely true. It's not a wish. It really happens. So I want to talk to you a little bit about social marketing. But first, let me put some things in context before I get started. So the title of our session with Clarissa, Doug, and myself is social marketing and vaccination acceptance. Not hesitancy, but vaccination acceptance. Understanding and addressing determinants of behavior and mechanisms of change in context. These are so important. Every word was chosen very, very carefully in the title of our session. We need to understand the context, the context in which people live, work, and play. We need to understand the determinants of behavior and non-behaviors before we can change them. I really appreciated so much of what I heard this morning. I have very much appreciated, Joanna, your talk yesterday, um, especially many things, but in particular one point is that we don't put communication at the end. It's not something we think about after. Because if we're going to communicate effectively, we need to understand the entire process. We need to understand people. We need to understand the environment in which they live. We need to understand the um, policies which hinder or facilitate behaviors. And to do that, if you do that after the fact, you're much more likely to have suboptimal communication and even perhaps communication that is harmful. So this is me. You already know that. Um, next, you're going to hear from Professor Dr. Doug Evans who is at the Milken Institute of Public Health at George Washington University in the States. He does a lot of work internationally. He's got a new project in, I think, three African countries. Um, I've heard him speak in many, many, many contexts. He's a great social marketer and does a lot of work in branding and branding health and is going to talk to us about that, creating demand, not just providing vaccination, but creating demand for vaccination, in particular in HPV. And then we're going to hear from Dr. Clarissa Hugh, Sue, excuse me, um, who's with Kaiser Permanente's uh, Health Research Institute in Seattle, um, among other academic appointments as well. And she's going to talk about one of the very core and most essential parts of social marketing, which is community engagement. So together, we'll share with you our, lear our learnings and our practice around social marketing, and we invite a dialogue. So after each presentation, if you have a burning question, please ask. But otherwise, I'd like to, to keep the dialogue for the end, and, and we can talk for as long as the, uh, the clock allows us to before uh, we're called for lunch. So social marketing, what is it? Most people don't understand it very well. I come from, I'm, I did my bachelor's degree in a business school in marketing. And I, when I got towards the end of my, my bachelor's degree, I started to realize that, wow, marketing is so powerful. It took me a while to get there, but I finally started to understand how powerful it is. It was so powerful that my minor was fashion, fashion marketing. People who know me today laugh, and I'm really happy that you all laughed too, because I don't care about clothes except that they're comfortable and sustainable. I started to say, but you know what? This is really interesting how people get us to buy things that are really bad for us and buy things that we don't need. Some things kill us, but we're drawn to them because they do such amazing market research. They understand us better than sometimes we understand ourselves. And I started auditing classes at the university down the street. We had two universities in my town. And I took a course in women's health as an auditing student. And I started to visit health organizations in my community. 
And I said, they're doing such great work, but they don't know how to market the product they're selling. And the product they're selling is health. And I come from a culture where marketing is not a bad word. And I know many of you come from cultures where marketing is a bad word. And you think it's evil, and it's tricky, and it's manipulative, and so forth. Social marketing builds on marketing, but it's considered ethical marketing, responsible marketing. The very first textbooks around that were uh, where social marketing appeared. So the first time social marketing appeared in the academic literature was in 1971, where it was framed ethical marketing, called social marketing. So we market things that are really good for us. And it used to be that marketing textbooks that we used in universities had a chapter on ethical marketing or responsible marketing. So it was a really small piece, yes? <laughs> and, and that was social marketing. So it was getting people to buy something that was good for them, for communities, and for society as a whole. Not based on our belief system, but based on data. Seatbelt use, for example, is one of the early behaviors that we marketed from a social marketing perspective. You may think it's an individual choice, or you may have thought back in the old days that wearing a seatbelt was an individual choice, but now we know, no, it has great societal impact. And you're more likely to ha have a critical accident or even death if you're in a, an, a car incident and you're not wearing your seatbelt. Helmet use, wearing a bicycle helmet when you're riding your bicycle or your scooter. It's not an individual choice. It impacts society, it impacts communities. So we started to look at marketing and say, you know what? If they can get us to buy the stuff we don't need, if they can get us to buy 25 handbags, you need one, right? Maybe you need a red one and a black one and a green one. See? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We can always rationalize our bad behaviors, but we can be convinced we need these things that we don't necessarily need. Maybe they're nice to have, and I don't critique anybody who has 25 handbags. That's, your, that's okay. But, but you don't need them. You want them. So in social marketing, what we try to do in an ethical way is help people understand how bad they want to be healthy. We do value health. It is absolutely clear some of the best, not the best, some of the most respected world leaders of all time have prioritized health and health policies. Tommy Douglas from Canada, anybody know him? I know we've got a lot of Canadians in the room. Winston Churchill, who once said, healthy citizens are a country's greatest asset. Many years later, he was, he was uh, named as one of the most important and most well-respected Britons of all time. He had a couple of other problems, of course, but <laughs> yes. But we do value health, but we often work so hard against it. So what we've seen, um, and, I, and what I like very much, so I switched to health studies and health, and health sciences and looked at health promotion and how, how, in which, how we promote health and how we market health and we create value in health. And what I've seen recently, and you, I know some of you, most of you are probably familiar with uh, the WHO SAGE Working Group on vaccination hesitancy. That and among many other uh, government documents, um, U European Union documents, et cetera, say social marketing is what we should be doing, especially in nutrition, physical activity to combat NCDs, non-communicable diseases, and in vaccination. So there is movement there. And typically, once governments say that we need to be doing something, a little bit of money follows. <laughs> Not a lot, but sometimes a little bit of money follows. So the WHO SAGE Working Group suggests that we should be doing social marketing to combat vaccination hesitancy. I would say to promote vaccination uptake. One of, a couple of things that I really like about what they've said here is that communication cannot only promote, not improve knowledge. That's good, yes, we need to improve knowledge, but it can also influence policy environment, and it can help realize behavior change. And most, a lot of what we heard this morning was focused on communication and messaging. Communication is a key component of strategies to address vaccination hesitancy. But communication alone will not solve our problems. And in fact, it can make it worse if not done properly. So relying only on communication is a big mistake. Whenever I, I joined the world of vaccination about four years ago at the iProof meeting where I met Angus and several other of you, of you in the room, and I found that a lot of people were very, 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 very focused on communication. Communication, communication. And what I found is that there was a will and a desire to do more. And so I started to look at the literature, and I looked at 
HPV vaccination in Europe. And the countries that had the highest rates of, of HPV vaccination uptake in Europe were countries that had the vaccine offered in the schools and for free. That's not a communication problem. That's an access problem. That's a policy problem or an access solution and a policy solution. Now, of course, to create good policies such as this, we need effective communication. So as you see here, again, WHO Sage Working Group recommends social marketing. Now, when I read through the report and I looked at the evidence behind the statement, I wasn't quite convinced that they understood truly what social marketing is. So I know we had a session on social marketing last year, and I came away saying, I'm not sure everybody's clear <laughs> again. So I'm hoping to at least um, provide a little bit more insight into social marketing, what it is and what it's not, during the next few minutes of my, my talk. What is social marketing? Is it communicating social issues? Is it communicating social behaviors? No. Part of it, yes, but it's not a synonym. Is it selling augmented products? In many areas of the world, social marketing is, is a synonym for selling a branded condom. It's not. It may be part of the social marketing program, but it's not about selling an augmented product, a product that supports a behavior. No. Social marketing seeks to develop and integrate marketing concepts with other approaches to influence behaviors that benefit individuals, communities, and society as a whole. Influence, not manipulate, not coerce, but to influence. And I know depending on where you come from, influence can also be perceived as a bad word. What I mean by that, by influence, is that influence is to help support people, provide persuasive argumentation and evidence so that they make their own choice. In this context, social, with social marketing, we're looking at voluntary behaviors. Once it's a mandate, it's a law. Now, we may promote and communicate why you have to follow the law and why it's important, but that's beyond the scope of social marketing. When we can't convince people to do it, then perhaps we need the law. And I'm very happy to, to know that there's some people here working in countries who've recently passed mandates. We'll be talking to, with, hearing from you all later. Social marketing is guided by ethical principles. It integrates research, market research, understanding customers and clients, pre-patients and patients. Best practice, what works? We don't reinvent the wheel, we learn from each other. It's one of the beautiful things about the European Social Marketing Conference that we have every two years, the World Social Marketing Conference, the Australian Association for Social Marketing has a wonderful conference as well. Many other um, places are also are establishing social marketing organizations. We share best practice, but we also share what we failed to do well, which is wonderful, and you don't read about much of that in the literature. It's informed by theory, what works, how do people, why do, why do people behave and why do they not behave? Audience and partnership insight, so understanding what people think, what motivates them, why they would or would not, not just in terms of a skill or technique, but what's in it for them. To inform the delivery of competition-sensitive, segmented social change approaches and programs that are effective, efficient, equitable, and sustainable. So this is a hefty goal. This is pretty, this is pretty um, you know, we're setting the standard high. But we have to do this because we're dealing with human lives. The director of our consumer behavior lab at my university, I'm the vice director, he's a pure marketer. He does client, his, some of his clients are BMW, the SBB, the train system in Switzerland, et cetera. And he often laughs and says, but you all are dealing with human lives. You have to really, really step back and do this slowly and do it well. You can't, we can't afford to get it wrong. And he's right. So social marketing, as you know from what I've said before, it's not only communication. Communication is imperative in what we do, but we use a process to get there, to make sure that our communication is correct. Communication is leveraged to help promote a social marketing product. And in social marketing, the product is a behavior. It's not something that we sell for money. It's a behavior. Vaccination is much more than a communication problem. I've cited some of the work for many of you in the audience and some of your colleagues here as well. 
Given the diverse reasons for parental refusal or delay in immunizations, a one-size-fits-all approach to health promotion founded on expert authority or articulation of the scientific evidence that supports immunization ignores the reality of how people are persuaded. So social marketing may hold the key. We talked about emotion yesterday. Vaccination is an incredibly emotional um, a behavior. Vaccination uptake is. So what is social marketing? I've told you why it matters and, and a little bit of the history. Social marketing is based on what we call eight consistency criteria. So when you look at a piece of communication, you can't say that's social marketing because it's not just communicating a social issue or social behavior. It's based on a very intensive and robust process based on these eight criteria. We call them the benchmarks or consistency criteria. So I know this is a marketing term, forgive me, but customer orientation. So the public, the, knowing the audience, knowing who you want to reach, it focuses on behavior, not just increasing knowledge, not just raising awareness, but changing behavior. It's based on theory, as I said before. Many theories, whichever theory is most appropriate in your context, We've seen health belief model today. We've seen integrative um, model. There are many, many, many models and theories out there. And we use what works in that circumstance with that audience. It's based on an exchange. And an exchange is what people have to give up to get the benefits. And if you don't understand that, if you don't understand what a person perceives to have to give up in order to perceive the benefit, then you're not likely to meet them where they are, and you're not likely to sell vaccination uptake very well. So you have to understand it's not top-down and it's not one-sided. We're dealing with humans. Whether it's time, whether it's going outside the norm, whether it's doing something different than their parents did. The competition, every marketer has a competition. From BMW, it may be Mercedes. In our case, it's non-vaccination. That's the competition for us. Insight, knowing what moves and motivates individuals. Mo not everybody is persuaded by not getting polio. Believe it or not, they're not. They really don't always think this way, yes? What do they want? What do they want? They want to live healthy. They want to be in charge of their life. They want to be around for their grandkids, their communities. They want to be able to go swimming in Lake Annecy. They want to be able to do lots of great things. And understanding what those things are, what matters to them, without judgment, without you saying, but that's not good for you. If that's what they want, you have to find a way in which you can create value in the behavior you're selling so it matches their needs and their wants. Or you have to find a way to try to persuade them that, yeah, you may think you want to sit on the couch all evening and do no physical activity. But what I know you really want <laughs> is to be able to, to fit in those pants in a month from now, right? We segment. One size does not fit all. Any woman ever buy a dress or a shirt that says one size fits all? They lie, they lie, they lie. We all are unique, absolutely all unique. We all have different circumstances. We, have, we come from different cultures. We come from different households with different parenting. Some of us may not have even had a parent in the house growing up. Um, you all come from different things, and you have your own perspectives on life. What we try to do is, what we don't try to do, we do, a segment in social marketing. So we find groups of people who are most similar to each other, and we target them in one way. Another group, you target in another way, and another group, you target in another way. If you have an incredibly heterogeneous population, then you need to tailor so that you reach the individual level. And it includes a methods mix, and by methods mix, we talk about six P's of social marketing, but also different strategies, different methods in which to persuade and to influence behavior change. So I'm gonna walk you through very, very quickly, as I see my time is coming up, very quickly I'm gonna walk you through the six P's of social marketing, which are kind of the foundations. Some say it's a little outdated, but it's the foundations of what we do in social marketing outside of the benchmarks. We have, as any marketing program, product, price, place, promotion. That's core in commercial marketing. In social marketing, we have two additional Ps, which are partnerships and policy. Because we know that health-enhancing policies, supportive environments, facilitate healthy behaviors. If you have to really, really struggle to find fruit, you're less likely to eat fruit. 
We want to make vaccination uptake easy, popular, it's the social norm, and some people would say fun. I don't know if, vaccin if vaccination is fun, but uh, the outcome is fun, right? Because we're protected. So product, we have three types of products. It's not, I'm not gonna be too academic here, and so you don't have to, I'm not gonna quiz you on this later. But the core product is what we are trying to get people to buy. That's the behavior. In our case, vaccination uptake, get vaccinated. The benefit is the actual product. So that's what we're really trying to, to achieve, is the benefit of being vaccinated. That may or may not be how we sell it, but that's what we're trying to achieve from a public health perspective. And are, are there any tangible or intangible products that would help people perform the behavior? Is there anything, a service, for example, would be a, 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 um, an augmented product? Um, what are, let me, I have to get, here we go, I've blown that up so you can see it a little bit better. What is the perceived value? So when we look at price, we don't focus only on monetary price. In some cases, that is one of the biggest barriers to vaccination, is the cost. If, it, if we believe so strongly and the evidence is so pro-vaccination, why should people have to choose vaccination, vaccinating their children over feeding them? Never should that be the case. If vaccination is that important, we have to make sure the monetary price is zero or affordable. What are the um, other barriers, such as safety concerns, accessibility, lack of knowledge, lack of trust in medical institutions, and as you know, that varies across cultures, um, beliefs and ideology, perhaps one of our biggest struggles, the biggest barriers for vaccination uptake, health literacy, one of the few behaviors that I know about and that I've seen data on where high health literacy works against us. Yes. I don't know how to deal with that one yet, <laughs> but it is true. These are that's part of the price. Place, where is, vaccina where is vaccination available? How easy is it to access? Multiple places, and sometimes having people come into a clinic can be one of the biggest um, place barriers. You see a great handbag you want and you can't find the store it's sold in, you're unlikely to buy it. Same with vaccination especially if you don't want it, if you have to really, really struggle to find it, you're less likely to buy it. Promotion, what do people need to know? What do they want to know? Some people say they need to understand the, the science behind vaccination in terms of how they work in their body and what they're composed of. And other people say, no, they just need to know that they protect you. Right? What do people need to know? Know your audience. Some people want more clinical information and some people giving them the clinical information will do more harm than good. What kinds of message framing works? We saw quite a bit of that last night in the talk. Who are trusted sources? Where do people get information? Here's an example. There's an example of, of promotion. Flu fighters is quite a, a, a common um, promotion. I looked across many, many countries, and, and flu fighters seems to be a, a, a common way to promote. So protect your, your patients, your coworkers, your family, and yourself. And they explain to you where to get it. So promoting also the place, also promoting the price, and also explaining to you a little bit about the background in terms of who's been vaccinated. I don't know that that's very helpful, but it, they have done that. What policies influence vaccination uptake? Reimbursement, location, exemptions. Is it mandatory? What happens if your children, if you have mandatory vaccination and a child doesn't get vaccinated? What do you do? And partnerships are all the people who need to be involved, involved from the beginning, from the beginning. So we ask ourselves these questions when we're designing social marketing pro projects. We don't focus on what is the message going to be first? That's one of the things we do at the end. Then we get to the message creation. And of course, that's exciting and it's more cre it is creative, but it's not where we start. It's where we finish. I have just a couple of slides because I'm out of time and, and we've got two examples of um, our two other speakers who've got some fantastic examples of their work. But what we have seen is the evidence for social marketing in many behaviors uh, is, is very strong and that social marketing has greater effects than other approaches to health promotion. And I've just included a couple of, of, of um, projects here focused on immunization in particular. And I've got, the, I've got a long list of references at the end of the slides and you'll get all of these slides. What I would like to just reinforce is that context matters. 
context matters. Not just the context in which you work, but the context in which people live. The causes of vaccination hesitancy varied in different countries and were context specific, indicating a need to strengthen the capacity of national programs to identify the locally relevant causal factors and develop adapted strategies to address them. Thanks, Abe, for, for this quote. Um, very powerful because it also shows that we can have national programs that we can segment at the local level. And the projects can be scalable, not exactly what you did in one community will work in another, but the process in which you use to create that program is scalable. As I started with policies, many policies are increasingly recognizing the importance of social marketing. And what I want to hear people, when, I, when people say they do social marketing, I wanna hear more and more about how you met the consistency criteria, the benchmark criteria, and how you address the P's, and how you got to know the audience. Unless a mandate is in place, vaccination is a voluntary behavior. So we're dealing with people's um, beliefs and willingness to accept, reject, or abandon vaccination. Social marketing moves beyond communication. Communication is critical, but alone, it's not enough. Transferability and scalability of social marketing process is possible and very, very advantageous. And it allows us to tailor single components of programs. So there may be programs that are transversal and that work across cultures and work across countries. You look at tiny, tiny Switzerland. We've got quite a number of Swiss people, or Swiss-based people here. I don't know your nationality, Swiss-based people here um, in the audience. And we know for such a tiny country, wow, it is diverse. <laughs> it is incredibly, we have four official languages plus English. Um, and, and it's very culturally different as well. Um, so parts of interventions may work across countries but specific components may not. And we need to be able to adapt those. When I work with, I work with many people. I'm one of those hybrid um, academics and practitioners, and which I love. I love to have my hands in both, both areas. I think it's very, very helpful, um, keeping my feet on the ground. And, and I learn a lot from both, both sides. I see, especially from governments of health, ministries of health, say, we don't have time to do social marketing. I say, you don't have time to get it wrong. You're dealing with taxpayer money. You have to get it right. Slow down doesn't mean you have to spend years developing a campaign, but get it right. Trust in government varies, and when you fail, you lose trust. And so you don't have time to get it wrong, because to regain that trust takes far more work than slowing down and understanding the situation and the context in which you're working. Get it right the first time, and if you don't, Try again, apologize, but at least, um, at least don't make excuses that you didn't have time to do it right. One campaign is not enough. As we heard so much last night, we have to repeat, 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 and we can't give up. Keep on, keep on, keep on. Formative research is not a nice to have. It is critical. Look at the evidence, look at what's published in the, in the gray and the academic literature. But, on, but do formative research, qualitative and quantitative, with the communities in which you're working to understand their needs and understand their perspectives and understand why they will or why they won't or be willing to or not be willing to vaccinate. Community and target audience engagement is critical, absolutely fundamental. Without doing that, you can make so many mistakes. You think you got it right and you go out into the community, you show them and they say, what, are you kidding me? You'll never, have that converse, you'll never have that reaction if you involve them early on. And Clarissa is going to talk to us about a project they've done in Washington State with community engagement. We need to brand programs and brand behavior. If it works for Coca-Cola, if it works for a product that kills us, why can't it work for health behaviors? It can. And Professor Evans, Doug, is going to talk to us about that in a moment. So with that, if there are any critical questions, I'll take them now, but I would prefer to have a dialogue at the end after you hear some examples of work from Doug and Clarissa. It's okay with you all. Any critical questions? Okay. Thank you very much.